Hello everybody, welcome back to a brand new episode of Mega Projects. This one is all about the Marshall Plan. You know that because you clicked on a video about the Marshall Plan. And I know this is a channel called Mega Projects, and I realize we're like really stretching what is possible as a Mega Project, but in a way, this absolutely was. I know you probably think, oh, it's about engineering, but it's not always. Mega Projects come in all flavors. This one was actually suggested by Ollie, the writer on this channel. I was like, Ollie, go for it. Let your creative spirit fly. So here we are, the Marshall Plan. Let's do it. But before we do, this video is brought to you by Finimize. Mega Projects viewers can test a seven day free trial with Finimize, a premier financial app that helps you invest with confidence. More on them in a bit. The 8th of May 1945, VE Day. Finally, victory in Europe. With the surrender of German forces the day before, the bloodiest theatre of combat the world had ever known came to a close. It would be just over three more months until the Japanese surrender brought the world to peace once again. And I remember celebrating VE Day as a kid. It was kind of fun. And you, uh, yeah, get to remember a little bit of history. Indeed, I have celebrated VE Day. I was an extra, this is off topic, in the original Captain America movie, and I was dressed up as a policeman celebrating VE Day in Trafalgar Square. That was weird. The scale of the devastation across Europe only became fully apparent once the fighting ceased. The continent lay in ruin, countries ravaged after six years of war. For the victors, a weary sense of triumph. But it would be a stretch to call anybody a winner. Europe was a broken, bankrupt continent on the verge of collapse. Something of gargantuan proportions would be needed to assist it. And that program came to be known as the Marshall Plan. The carnage of World War II left a very different global landscape. An estimated 60 million people had died, 25 million of those within the Soviet Union alone. The great cities of Europe lay in ruin with untold millions now homeless. Heavy industry had been decimated on both sides and rebuilding it would be the key to reconstruction of the continent. The true effects of the United States' Marshall Plan are still debated more than ever in the modern era, but unquestionably Europe before the plan and the one after was a very different place. I'm going to go into the plan and its various sections later on in this video, but let's start with a bit of a quick overview. The Marshall Plan ran from 1948 to 1951, though a similar style of plan also ran between 1951 and 1961 and involved 16 different nations who roughly received aid on a per capita basis. The goal of the plan was essentially to rebuild Europe by reconstructing its shattered industry, modernizing its methods, and increasing trade. It was not not quite as simple as just writing a series of checks, never is, we'll come to that a bit later. Now, The plan was originally the European Recovery Plan, but eventually it was named after the United States Secretary of State George Marshall, who had played a pivotal role in its implementation. Marshall would go on to be named Times Person of the Year in 1948, by the way, no doubt having the largest economic recovery plan in history named after you didn't hurt his cause. It was three years after the end of the war when the Marshall Plan was enacted and funds and goods began to move across the Atlantic. Though recovery certainly began during those years, Europe was still totally shattered. More than a quarter of the UK's national wealth had just disappeared. The level of debt the country had was in the region of £21 billion, which doesn't sound that bad until you realize this was the 1940s, and that's about a trillion pounds today. Much of it was loans by foreign nations, in particular the United States. A loan from both the United States and Canada in 1946 just about kept the country going, but it didn't stop bread rationing from being introduced between 1946 and 1946. 1948, something that didn't even occur during wartime. Quite astonishingly, the debt to both countries was not finally paid off until 2006, 61 years after the end of the war. The 50th installment completed the repayment of the $4.1 billion, $27 billion today loan. If you're wondering why it wasn't paid off in 50 years, it was because Britain was allowed to defer payments for specific years pretty much whenever it wanted, something that it did six times. Nice friendly Americans and Canadians there be like, don't worry guys, you pay off your debt when you like. <laughs> 
<laughs> Credit card companies, a little bit different. Elsewhere, conditions were equally grim, if not actually worse. Germany had been partitioned into four sections, with Britain, France, the US, and USSR each administering one section. On top of that, the country had lost a quarter of its pre-war land area, with Germans living in these areas either expelled or not permitted to return if they had fled during the fighting. The official stance of the United States with regards to Germany was that, except to prevent starvation, no help would be granted to it to aid the rebuilding of the country. In fact, in the immediate years after Germany's surrender, the Allies continued to systematically dismantle the country. The deindustrialization of the country called for its heavy industry to be reduced to 50% of the level of 1938. After two years, this position began to soften. Perhaps some were reminded of the deep bitterness that the Treaty of Versailles had left on the German people after World War I. The treaty effectively crippled the country for years to come. Then a certain Adolf Hitler arrived on the scene, screaming and shouting about in justices. Europe and the US could continue to punish Germany, but it soon became clear that a strong and peaceful Germany would be key to building a better Europe. The cycle it needed to be broken. The plan was initially drafted by the participating European states on the 5th of June 1947, but was not signed by President Truman until the following year on April the 3rd. Now, it additionally granted $5 billion, $54 billion today in aid to 16 European countries, but this was also followed by $17 billion, $183 billion today in economic and technical assistance. The two biggest recipients were the UK and France, with $3.2 billion, $34.5 billion today, and 2.2 billion, 23.7 billion today. Holland, West Germany, and Italy were the three countries whose aid surpassed $1 billion, $10 billion today. The biggest priorities of the plan were to increase European industrial output and to free up trade in and out of the continent. If I was to suggest a rather more clandestine but very more obvious purpose, it was also implemented to prevent the spread of communism in Europe and to cement American power in the region. I mean, make no mistake about it, the Marshall Plan brought much needed aid, but it definitely was wasn't this entirely selfless act. The implementation was super complex. It wasn't as simple as just wiring the money and allowing the countries to do whatever they wanted with it. Much of the aid came in goods, usually bought from the US, and technical assistance, which we'll come to in a moment. Goods that were shipped across the Atlantic were then sold at dollar value within the participating countries, and the profit made paid into the European Recovery Plan, the ERP, bank accounts that were held by the central bank in the individual countries. The accumulated funds in these accounts could be spent as the countries wanted. France and Germany used much of it for long-term reconstruction projects, while the UK splashed out a huge amount on debt repayment. Oh my god, just the, the, the extent of the debt, the, the fact that they paid off a lot of it with grants, and then they still had to pay it off in 2006 is extraordinary. By mid-1951, over $13 billion, $130 billion today worth of aid had made its way across the Atlantic. $3.4 billion, $33.9 today on imports of raw materials and semi-manufactured products. $3.2 billion, $31 billion today on food, feed and fertilizer. $1.9 billion, $18.9 billion today on machines, vehicles and equipment. And $1.6 billion, $15.9 billion today on fuel. And I know... Some of you in the comments are going to be like, Simon, we don't need to know every present day value. And I'm like, yeah, you do, because it really gives you a true idea of the scale. Counterpart funds, which were funds provided in the local currency, also played a key role in the recovery. These were often used to provide loans for private businesses with the stipulation that 60% of total funds be spent on industry. In 1949 and 1950, 40% of West Germany's investments in its expanding coal industry came from these funds. Once a business repaid its debt, that money would be used for another business and so on and so on, with the small amounts of interest steadily building up over time. This was a system that provided the backbone to the German and recovery, and it is still in use today. While others rattled through their funds, German politicians made a concerted effort to continuously recycle theirs. The pot of money was worth 10 billion Deutschmarks in 1971 and had grown to 23 billion Deutschmarks in 1997. By the end of 1995, a total of 140 billion Deutschmarks had been used for private loans in Germany. And we wonder why they've done rather well for themselves. Another key aspect of the Marshall Plan was the technical 
assistance program. Not only did governments want their industries rebuilt, but most were more than a little intrigued about the astonishing productivity that was coming out of U.S. factories. Through the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, the BLS, studies of labor productivity were used to advise foreign nations and often hosted foreign visitors to the U.S. to tour American workplaces. France alone sent 500 separate groups to the U.S., totaling 4,700 businessmen and experts. American economists, statisticians, and engineers were able to compare productivity numbers between the U.S. and European nations, which could highlight certain strengths and weaknesses. On the back of this, new machinery and technology could be provided to raise productivity, and you can probably guess where this machinery came from – Uncle Sam. Now, I know that sounds like walking into a car garage and asking the dubious mechanic if he knows of any additions you might need, but broadly speaking, it actually did do the job. As I'll come to later, industrial output did rise enormously, and no doubt these kinds of productivity drives did help. And hey look, it's not just 1940s Europe that can benefit from the help of a few good economists. You can take your finance game to the next level with today's sponsor, Finomize. How's that for a transition? Finomize is a brilliant new app that shares a wealth of financial news and advice so that you can take advantage of stocks and money markets and all of that finance -y stuff that your friends are talking about and you're like, what guys? Yeah, I mean, me too. I invest my money sensibly. <laughs> What? Now maybe you're thinking, Simon, I studied art history in school. I don't know how to read my own checkbook. Who has a checkbook anymore? I don't know how to read my own bank statements. Whatever. No problem. Finomize wants to be your own financial advisor, and it's giving you all the tools you need to invest confidently and intelligently. All its news and advice is written in plain English, using words that regular people like you and I can understand. Personally, I like the daily brief. I, I like a lot of you guys, I'm pretty busy making, you know, like 4,000 videos a day, and I don't always have the time to track every little bit of market movement. Finomize does that for me. Quick little daily section, and it's available as a text article or if you don't like reading, just listen to the audio form. They've got that as well. It's fantastic. It's also got these cool uh, plus 100 packs that offer in-depth profiles on companies and industries that you can study before making an investment decision, plus premium insights that break down market opportunities as they happen. You guys can get seven days for free and 20% off the cost of the premium yearly subscription by clicking the link down below in the description. And that seven-day trial is completely free. Cancel at any time and you won't be charged. So if your money isn't working for you and you want to change that or if you want to give yourself a crash course in finance and investing and you should, check it off friends at Finomize and let's get back to the Marshall Plan. Perhaps as a show of faith, or maybe to force Stalin to make its position clear, the Marshall Plan was offered to both the Soviet Union and its satellite states. After six weeks of negotiations, this was rejected out of hand by Stalin, who may have feared the capitalist influence he could bring. Probably a justified fear. It worked really well. The Soviets had in fact been keen on slowing the European recovery rather than speeding it up while pursuing reparation claims against Germany and other countries that it had fought against. The US USSR also prohibited the Eastern Bloc countries, everything east of the Berlin Wall, from participating in the plan. Czechoslovakia and Poland had both been eager to take part in the plan, but both were pacified with aid deals from the Soviet Union. It quickly became clear that the battle lines were once again being drawn in Europe, the West and the East, those taking part in the American recovery plan, and those who, for many different reasons, stayed under the control of the Soviet Union. The greatest war the world had ever known had just finished. But the Cold War that was just getting started. Seventy years later, this is a question that is still keenly debated. Some claim that Europe was already well on its way to recovery after the war, while others believe that the Marshall Plan was the cornerstone to it all. The four years between 1948 and 1952 saw the biggest growth Europe had ever seen. Now, that's not entirely surprising considering where the continent had come from, but a 35% increase in industrial output is still a phenomenal achievement. As I mentioned earlier, Europe before and after the plan were very different places. 
But the idea that this was some kind of miracle plan that saved the continent single-handed is certainly a stretch. If anything, it was an excellent stimulus package that gave the European economies the jolt that they required. But it was still fairly small scale when we think about nations' economies. Grants from the Marshall Plan accounted for roughly 3% of the combined national income of the participating countries, which would equate to just a 0.3% increase in overall GDP. Some modern historians now look back at it more as an act of US imperialism and a front to battle communism rather than something that brought about dramatic change. What is particularly interesting is that the speed of the recovery was not equal and certainly wasn't linked to the amount the country received under the Marshall Plan. Britain and France took more than West Germany, and yet recovery was significantly slower. Former US Chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank Alan Greenspan wrote that Europe's recovery had more to do with Germany's economic policy of trade and slow, steady rebuilding than with the Marshall Plan. Now, whatever you think of the Marshall Plan, it's impossible to deny that two things emerged from it. Firstly, Europe rose stronger than it ever had. While the establishment of the European Union in 1993 was still many decades off, the stage was set for considerably better cooperation between European nations. Once it was allowed to re-establish its industries, a revitalized West Germany set a blistering pace in terms of recovery, and by the 1950s its unemployment was so low that the country began allowing foreign immigrants to settle in the country, many from Turkey. The second aspect to emerge from the Marshall Plan was a supremely powerful United States. No doubt the Marshall Plan was a gracious act providing much-needed assistance to an impoverished continent, but it was a gracious act that the US greatly benefited from. It kept the booming American industrial machine ticking over, while also facilitating significantly better trade contracts throughout Europe. The plan helped keep the dreaded wave of communism behind the Iron Curtain, and helped to export American ideals of freedom and democracy to Europe. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. I think after doing this video, whatever you think about it, we can all agree the Marshall Plan is certainly a mega project. If you've got a suggestion for a future video, please do leave it in the comments below. And as always, oh, check out our fantastic sponsor, Finimize, and I'll see you next time.